Come on in. We're going to get started. Uh, so this year has been, got a little bit of feedback, um, a little bit different on the organizing. Uh, I kind of, the metaphor I use, I like metaphors, so the metaphor I used was like a greatest hits. I wanted to get like all the hits back together, some of our favorite sessions and speakers, and bring them back and uh, kind of see where everyone's at now. And and, and, you know, on all the best Greatest Hits albums, there's always the one new song. And so that's Davy. Davy's never speak, spoken. But she's awesome. And uh, she's going to speak to us next. So thank you for coming and being our, uh, our plus one reason to buy the album. Awesome. Can you all hear me? Sounds good. Testing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Um, Mountain West has been a conference that's been on my wish list for a long time. Never worked out before this year, and I'm just so happy to have been able to be a part of the very last Mountain West Ruby. Uh, so, I am from Portland, Oregon. Our slogan is, of course, keep Portland weird. And I'm keeping it weird with the feedback. Uh, we have the smallest park in the world right here. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I've taken many of people who visited Portland to this park. It's in the middle of the street, so you kind of have to like dodge cars to get there. I think it's worthwhile. Um, we, of course, have Portlandia, which is about 50% documented. Testing? Testing? Okay. So Portlandia, mostly a documentary. This, of course, is one of my favorite sections of Portlandia, putting a bird on everything since 1999. I do my part to keep Portland weird. This is my cat, Kamaji. Uh, he goes for walks. He loves going for walks. He's very gregarious. Um, he's also on Twitter. Not quite as famous as Gorby Puff, though, maybe one day. Uh, I came by yesterday at the conference and I decided to wear contacts instead of glasses and had at least two or three people have no idea who I was. So today I'm wearing my glasses so you can all remember me. And yes, that did make me feel like a superhero. Uh, I work for GitHub. I'm an engineering manager for the team that works on the availability and performance of the Rails app. Uh, it also means that I have stickers, lots of them. So if anyone wants some stickers, come find me afterwards. There's a good cow one. Uh, unfortunately, we have retired all of our copyright infringing stickers so that we don't get sued. So no more of, you know, Zelda sticker or Rainbow Dash sticker. I'm sorry. I don't have any of them. <laughs> GitHub likes to stay in business and not get sued out of business. Okay, so on to my actual talk. Uh, so I, the title of this talk is Orders of Magnitude. And the concept is that I'm going to be talking about numbers, uh, big numbers and small numbers, and a bunch of numbers in between. And more importantly, I'm going to be talking about how our brain conceptualizes and processes numbers. So number sense is the concept that uh, certain animals have an innate conceptualization of numbers and counting, and built directly into their brains, and they don't have to learn about numbers. Uh, it might not be surprising to think that animals such as elephants, dolphins, many of the great apes uh, have number sense. Uh, but it's also been shown that animals such as birds have number sense, and even insects such as bees and ants show a, the ability to be able to tell the differences between numbers. And so what this usually means is that they can tell the difference between one of something versus two or some, of something. They can even tell the difference between three and four. Uh, Oftentimes, it tends to break down at around five or six, but then uh, oftentimes animals have the ability to differentiate between uh, sets of numbers that have a bigger difference, such as like eight versus 12. What, uh, you know, we also might expect that humans have number sense, right? We like to think that we're pretty good at this whole counting thing. 
But the science shows that we're not actually that much measurably better than any of the other animals that we study. Uh, tribes that haven't developed finger counting yet oftentimes have a very difficult time determining differences between numbers of about, above about four. And that is, you know, kind of surprising. So this brings us to, you know, one of the first misconceptions that we might have about our brains and how we process numbers, which is that, you know, our brains don't actually inherently understand uh, numbers beyond one through four. So we are born with number sense, but we must learn how to count. So it's hard to imagine life before counting, uh, but learning to count was only really advantageous to humans once we started uh, farming or uh, herding or managing livestock. That was kind of when you needed to figure out how many sheep you might have. And so the, we were using, we invented things called like finger counting, uh, tallying via stones, uh, notches on sticks, or knots on rope to help us manage these numbers that were um, bigger than what we could understand ourselves. So, you know, now that we, we, don't, we don't yet have words for these numbers, but we are able to keep track of our flock of sheep by keeping a pebble in our pockets for each one. And before you think that this is like a really naive or simplistic way of managing numbers, the Incas uh, managed to keep track of a vast, you know, uh, civilization based around, you know, vast numbers of numbers by using what was known as rope counting or keeping uh, knots on string in order to keep track of the, the currency or the, you know, the values that they were having to deal with within their civilization. So once that we figured out that we needed to count, then the next step was, was determining that maybe we should have names for these number things. Uh, it's easier to say, I have eight sheep, than saying, I have this many sheep, and piling out your little pile of rocks from your little pouch. Uh, and initially, many of the first number systems only had uh, names for you know, numbers such as one, two, and many tribes that exist today that still have only these numbers uh, represented with words are the San people of Namibia, the various Aboriginal tribes in Australia, and the Paraha tribe of the Amazon. Uh, the next thing that we kind of see is having many different names for the number words. So an example here is the Thymshian language, which is a tribe up in British Columbia. And they had completely different sets of names for, for numbers, depending on what you were counting. So if you were counting flat objects, you'd be using a completely different value of three than if you were counting uh, men. I also particularly like that they had a whole different set for long objects and trees, but then canoes were a completely new category, so canoes were very important to them. And before we start thinking that this is incredibly silly, the English language has the history of this built into it directly. So we can see here, we have many different words for the number two. And this is kind of a, a relic of even our own ancestors having this sort of thinking when dealing with numbers. A brace is oftentimes used when you're, uh, like a brace of horses to, to run a cart. That's one, one use of it. So a paired set of animals. So that brings us to our second lie, that counting things is easy. Even coming up with the names for numbers is difficult. And, uh, and that the names that we use to count can vary wildly. So abstract number counting is actually kind of a difficult thing to discover. And counting takes mental energy. So now that we have uh, learned how to count and we have words to describe our numbers, the next step is to create numeral systems. Uh, we all, of course, are familiar with Roman numeral uh, system, which is an improved tallying counting system. Their, uh, main the main points of this one is it's positioned by value and then also has subtractive notation in that. So that's one, one advancement over uh, pure stick tallying. The main problem here is that it still takes a little bit of time to analyze what number is involved. Uh, who can say what number? Shout it out. 1928, but you have to do some counting and ordering in order to gather that up. So that still takes a little bit of mental energy. Next, we came up with the Arabic counting system. And this one uh, was a little bit different because in this numeral system, each number base gets a representational character. 
And then we have positional notation, where the sequence of digits themselves creates the number. And we find this to be a lot easier to parse and uh, understand what number we're coming up with. Once we had this positional notation system, the concept of exponentiation followed quickly after. Now that the digits themselves have a place, that place can itself be counted. So here, one of our, the common ways we reference uh, exponential notation here is by using a 10 to the power. Uh, another way to reference this is with E notation, um, where E rep completely replaces the 10 to the, and from now on I'm going to be using this notation mainly because it's shorter and I don't have to do the subscript, which is kind of irritating to do in Keynote, so E from now on out. Uh, so we also have discover, uh, determined names for these different positions as well. And of course, we couldn't stick to just one naming convention. We have multiple. So we're still continuing on our trend of you know, naming things multiple times when only one could do. <laughs> number subsystems allow us to count bigger and bigger numbers, uh, and much smaller numbers as well. But that brings us to another lie, which is that naming these numbers does not necessarily mean that we understand them. So to recap. Humans have number sense, but that only helps us up to about number four. Counting is hard, and naming doesn't equal understanding. So how can we use this to apply to our day-to-day -day life, right? We're all programmers, and so far I've just been telling you the history of numbers. Uh, well, one common way that we kind of already do this inherently is to you know, block out our web pages into different sections, right? It's a lot easier to understand a web page and navigate on it. If there's only three sections rather than 17. That keys into our inherent number sense to be able to determine the different sections. So here I have you know, a header, uh, a right column, and then the main body. Another way we can help ourselves is to, instead of having a table of numbers, just graph it. Um, create a visual that allows you to understand the relationship between the numbers instead of having to scan through a table of numbers and try and parse that information that way. It also uh, helps impact some of our design philosophies, the sort of the idea that each method should only have a certain number of lines within them. Uh, that also keys back to this concept of number sense. If there's three items, three, three things that this method is doing, one after the other. It's easy for our brains to immediately see that and understand that as opposed to if it was doing 15 things in, in order. And this, of course, can apply to good testing behavior, too. Uh, I think that this also applies to sort of our object hierarchy. It's a lot easier to understand the flow of what's happening where if you only have a certain small subset of classes to look at. And if you can open them up in your editor all next to each other. We want to try and avoid that class that Aaron showed us yesterday with 10,000 ancestors. That's going to be a little bit difficult to deal with. And speaking of our dear friend Tenderlove, he said something yesterday that uh, is really important in, when understanding this concept, right? A number is meaningless to me. I need to know the class name. And so that's, you know, again, referencing that having something, uh, a name, a, a, a text string to be able to understand rather than just referencing some random four, five, six, eight digit number. That's going to be a lot easier for all of us to understand. So in order to talk about what really big and small numbers are, first we need to create a baseline uh, for our human experience. And so I'm going to be doing this for both distance and time. For the baseline of distance, I'm going to be using the, uh, the default value of one meter. That's you know, approximately the size of a human, about how far you can reach within your space around you. So if that's our baseline, what's the smallest thing that a human can experience in the uh, and that is about something about the width of a human hair. And that's going to be e to the negative 4. And the biggest thing that we can experience is a mountain. A mountain is something we can see in the distance, but it's also something we can climb. We can physically walk the entire uh, breadth of it and understand how large that is. And that's about e to the 4. For time, I am going to say that the baseline of human experience is about one hour. Um, you know, one minute seems like way too short, right? Like one hour we block our things into one hour or half hour time chunks. That's a good uh, experience, like central experience of how we experience time. And in that realm, the smallest time that we can experience is the blink of an eye, which again is about e to the negative four. The biggest thing that we can experience 
is, of course, our own lifespan. And that is about 100,000 hours or e to the 5. So this brings us to another lie, that we have direct experience with very big and very small numbers. You know, you could see that the common thread with that was that, that the, our experience is from the width of a hair to a mountain, or from the blink of an eye to a lifespan. Those are in the thousands to thousands range, which in the grand scheme of things is not very big or small. So humans long ago discovered that clear curved surfaces magnified and distorted light but we did not really understand the mathematics behind it for uh, a while later. That didn't stop us from carving lenses in order to try and magnify the world around us. So this is the Nimrod lens, which dates to about 750 BC, and these lenses were, have been discovered in areas such as ancient Assyria, Egypt, Greece, and Babylon. These lenses were barely more than crude magnifiers, but they were kind of the first ways that humans were able to experience things beyond what our naked eye would allow us. Optic theory was the study of how the light bends uh, when uh, going through mirrors and lenses. And the law of refraction was required in order to really compute the shape of lenses that could uh, drastically increase the availability of investigating the world around us. So at about 1590 was when the first microscope, microscope was invented, and 1608 was when the telescope was invented. And this, of course, allowed us to drastically expand our world beyond what we had previously been able to experience. So let's go back to our baselines and see how much further we've expanded things since then. When we were going smaller, we were able to discover bacteria at e to the negative 6. Uh, the microprocessor memory cell right now is about e to the negative 8, the 14 nan nanometer resolution, began shipping in uh, 2014. The current smallest gate length of our processors is e to the negative 9, the size of a 16 nanometer processor. And that's pretty fantastically small when you consider the atoms themselves are, are about e to the negative 10, and the electron is e to the negative 15. We're also able to explore things much bigger. The moon is about e to the 6. The sun is e to the 9. And the sun is not even the biggest star that we've been able to study. We have Rigel at e to the 11 and Betelgeuse at e to the 12. And because I studied astrophysics, you're going to get a quick lesson here. So both uh, Betelgeuse here are, and Rigel are, are in this uh, constellation Orion. Here you can see Betelgeuse is the, the left shoulder of Orion. Uh, Rigel is the right foot, and then because the gods were kind to us, they also put Sirius right here, the brightest star in the sky. So these are three of the brightest stars, easily, easily viewable. It's also kind of cool to see both the red giant and the blue giant, as you can see the colors here. Okay, continuing on, we've also been able to study things such as the pillars of creation, uh, E to the 16. These are interstellar gas and dust in the Eagle Nebula. They are so named because uh, this this mass of gas is currently creating brand new stars. And this, of course, is even a tiny subset of a much larger uh, constellation and collection of stars. The leftmost pillar in this picture is about four light years in length. So we can also expand our experience of, of time as well. When we're going smaller, we are able to determine that the, a single synapse in our brain is about e to the negative seven. In 1980, we had created processors that, uh, at 5 megahertz, which is about e to the negative 10. And our current 3.5 gigahertz processors are e to the negative 13. When looking at the bigger scale, the current oldest known living thing on Earth is a bristlecone capine that's been alive for 5,000 years, or e to the 7. Humanity itself has only been around for uh, about 200,000 years, or e to the 9. Dinosaurs beat us out handily with their 100 million year lifespan, or e to the 12. And so, you know, what is this telling us? You know, there's another big lie that we have been, we have not been able to explore the world in, you know, this great depth for very, very long. This is only the last couple hundred years have we even been able to uh, expand beyond the thousands and thousands. <clears throat> so, another thing that our brain is responsible for is. Uh, to determine risk and estimate the odds of dangerous things. 
Clearly, we have a desire to keep ourselves alive. It's kind of important. And therefore, we need to determine what sorts of things are risks to our lives. Unfortunately, we're not really good at this and tend to prioritize uh, things that are immediate short-term risks rather than paying, along, uh, paying attention to longer-term risks. Here, we, you know, we have a very visceral reaction to the, the idea of being attacked by sharks or being bitten by snakes, and yet we daily ride in cars or smoke cigarettes. In the world of computing, this, we might think of this as, as our uh, concept around our nines, right? When we're talking about the availability of our software, we like to couch it in how many nines we have, referring to the number of nines past 90% uh, of the availability of our website. So we have one nine, and that allows us about 36 and a half days per year downtime. That's pretty easy. I think all of us can meet that pretty well, unless we're maybe government agencies. Uh, so hopefully we're going to start by, by aiming for, at the very minimum, two nines, which is still, you know, still 3.65 days per year down is kind of bad. We should probably try and do better than that. So three nines. Three nines gets us to 8.76 hours of downtime in every year. Four nines, 52.56 minutes. Five nines, which you know is one of the biggest holy, holy grails uh, of services, website services today. That's only five, just under five and a half minutes, or maybe five and a quarter, five and a quarter minutes a year down. So, what about nine nines? Anyone have an idea of how much downtime we'd be allowed if it was nine nines? Anyone want to throw something out? It's going to be 31.5 milliseconds, otherwise known as 31 brain synapses in our brains. So that's how much time we'd be allowed to be down if we wanted to get to nine nines. <laughs> so this kind of brings us to another lie, of course, which is that our brains are good at calculating odds. <laughs> how many times have any of you heard any of these statements? <laughs> I think all of us have, right? And my answer to that one is no. no. As the number of possible instances grows, the chances of any of these things occurring are increase dramatically. So, we now have uh, understanding that extremely large and small numbers are re relatively new experiences to humanity as a whole, and that our brains are really bad at calculating the odds of something occurring. How many of you have experienced this sort of thing? <clears throat> so, now we're going to talk about, like, you know, what are the sort of edge cases here. So this fellow, Hubert Wolfstern, is uh, the man with one of the, I think the, according to Wikipedia, the longest official name. So he has one name for each letter of the alphabet, but that only takes us to Zeus. And then this is this guy's last name, Senior. So thank you, Germany. Do you think that your site can handle Mr. Hubert trying to sign up? Which he can't, because he already died, but, you know, maybe he has another son, Junior. Yeah. And then, of course, we also have, you know, people like Cher, uh, who legally only have one name. And celebrities aren't the only people that live, uh, fall in this category. The royal family of both Japan and Thailand, I think, uh, also traditionally only have one name. So, you know, if the emperor of Japan wants to sign up for your site, maybe you should let him. <laughs> and then, of course, there are the people who suffer from dealing with their hyphenated names, uh, other funny Unicode characters, and then someday, sometime soon, maybe it's already happened, there's going to be some poor soul with an emoji character in their name. <laughs> so uh, email is another common one in this, in this realm, right? So we might understand like, being able to parse and handle these types of emails with the plus sign as a filtering mechanism for Gmail, or now that we have all sorts of ridiculous domain names that we can purchase. Um, but that's only a part of it. So this is an excerpt from the Wikipedia list of valid email addresses. So, you know, do you think that you can write a regex that can correctly parse all of these? I'm not going to try. I would suggest you don't either. Uh, and that's only, you know, this is not the end of what we have to deal with when we're dealing with edge cases and exceptions. Uh, when, uh, it's also pretty important when you're adding protections for the explicit ex expectations that edge cases will be met by your software. Uh, this includes using mutexes uh, to deal with uh, possibly concurrent requests, uh, handling database transactions correctly so that you don't lose data or double save data, 
and of course, being able to correctly enqueue and dequeue background jobs. It's also important when you're thinking about whether or not your test suite is really encompassing all of the, the cases that you need it to. Are you just testing the happy path? Uh, deployments, is your deployment process itself hindering your ability to get that next nine? And uh, when dealing with data migrations, you know, are you, your, your customer's data is gold to them. Are you treating it with that level of respect to protect that information for them? So human experience overall has increased drastically in the last 100 years. We have moved from a realm of only experiencing things in the thousands to thousands range to expanding to the millionths to millions, billionths to billions, and trillionths to trillions. In order to write scalable code, we must be developing for that millionth user, billionth request, and trillionth event. And if you take away only one thing from this talk, I would say that the, the edge case is the certainty. Don't think that, that something, just because it's going to be very unlikely, is not going to happen. Uh, make sure that your software can uh, accept that edge case. And thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. So how has an education in astrophysics uh, affected my career? Um, one, I was really, really happy not to have to uh, code in the programming languages that was popular in astrophysics. So that was basically like Fortran. So <laughs> now, um, like, uh, I think one of the, the most interesting things about astrophysics was really learning about the ways that we as humans tried to, just to learn about things beyond our own world when all you have to, to study is the, the photons kind of hitting the Earth? Like, how do you figure out what materials the sun is made of or how far away things are? Um, being able to, to try and figure out how to query that information from a very limited subset of data and being really creative about it is pretty amazing, and I think that actually we do that a lot in programming as well. Uh, you know, we're dealing with with computers that are you know running on electricity, right? Uh, it can be incredibly hard to debug things that are going wrong in your servers when all you have possibly is a tiny stream of electrons flowing out of it. How do we debug what's happening and understand what's happening within our computers with that limited amount of information? We have to be creative. So the question is, do you have a ways to try and calculate the risk of certain edge cases uh, when you're programming? And the answer to that is metrics. Record everything all the time. If you don't have um, you know, metrics on things when things are going right and when things are going wrong, you don't have any way to do any sort of calculation or comparison or see when things, uh, things are, are uh, happening poorly. And that's something, you know, especially that, that GitHub itself is very well known for and is still relies heavily on is storing information about every single thing that's happening at every layer of the stack and having something to create graphs. Again, numbers are useless, being able to see trends, uh, to see how things are changing even slightly week, week over week or day over day is very important. A full set of logging or a statistical set of logging. And that's, um, so that's actually case by case. There are certain areas where uh, the storage requirements of full logging is uh, not, um, not feasible, and so then you have to pick a percentage, random percentage, you know, are you going to uh, log 10% of things that are happening or versus 100? So that's, like, again, it's almost always case by case and what your particular um, storage requirements or abilities are. That's a good question. So that's the, any, do you have a rule of thumb on balancing the, the cost of trying to manage the ever more increasingly rare edge cases uh, as opposed to, like, the time that that requires? And again, like, all of that is... Um, based on each, each project, each company's particular use case. What are the resources available? Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's hard to give any particular answer, right? You want to be, you want to be um, certain enough. What was the, the phrase in Ernie's talk yesterday about the skyscrapers, right? You want to be uh, relatively certain um, with the uh, abilities that you have. That, that acceptably unlikely. You want it to be acceptably unlikely that something like that's going to happen. And that definition of acceptably might change, depending on the size and, and scope of, of your project. Uh, so the question is, do we use any process improvement tools like Six Sigma? Um, and no, not really. So uh, the question is basically, uh, have I come across any resources that would help 
people play around with a relative scale to try and understand like the difference between million uh, versus billion, for example. And um, no, and I actually did spend some time trying to find something like that. Um, honestly, like one of the resources that I've loved the most when kind of putting things into perspective like this is some XKCD comics. I think that he's done a couple, I think he did one on like currency and how much things were worth that was like really amazing in uh, kind of bringing out the scale of, of those numbers. So honestly, maybe just XKCD. I think that might be it. Thank you. <laughs>